I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of The National Interest, and it is my privilege today to host Barry Guin, a longtime editor at the New York Times Book Review and the author of a recent book on Henry Kissinger called The Inevitability of Tragedy, Henry Kissinger and His World, which was published by Norton and published also mostly to acclaim with some, a few criticisms of his book. And today I wanted to talk with Barry, who is an expert on Kissinger, who died yesterday at the age of 100, about Kissinger's record and his legacy. Barry, the first question that I wanted to pose to you was, Kissinger seems to be falling into a, a bifurcated response. Either people are saying, especially if you look on X, the former Twitter, Kissinger is a madman, he's a war criminal, he's a disgrace. Why is the establishment embracing him? And then you have a number of extremely positive responses or memories of Kissinger, not just by his own acolytes and those who worked for him, but also more broadly in the media, Kissinger's reputation seems to be higher now than it was, say, 20 years ago. What's your take? I've been deeply troubled at some of the responses to Kissinger's uh, death, particularly uh, those who are branding him a warmonger. Um, I think Rolling Stone had in its headline something like, Kissinger the warmonger dies. I forget how they 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 put it, but but that's common in a certain community, and maybe I shouldn't be troubled by it, but I do think um, that the responses to Kissinger have become more extreme over the years, maybe not the praise as, as you were describing it, but the hostility to him. And um, in, in shorthand, I would say that's a result of the general polarization in our society, though um, Kissinger is someone who I think cuts across a lot of those uh, woke polarizations. But still, I think the polarization is one explanation. But if we want to dig a little deeper, I would say that Kissinger's brand of realpolitik, uh, which I try to lay out in my book, is really antithetical to what most Americans believe or want to believe about foreign policy. One of the main uh, disagreements being over the question of whether we should promote um, democracy and human rights. Uh, Kissinger tended to view people who took that point of view as crusaders um, who were willing to go around the world imposing their own sense of morality upon societies that were very different from our own and who might have very different views of what um, uh, democracy and freedom were all about. And I think this was a message that um, got him, um, if not branded a war criminal, certainly generated a lot of hostility because it went so against the American brain. Well, Barry, the, the bill of indictment against Kissinger, as you know, is fairly straightforward. It is that he represented a repudiation of American values and injected an alien European import, namely realpolitik, into the American foreign policy debate and system. And that this resulted in mass casualties abroad, whether it was East Timor or whether in Vietnam or in Cambodia, that Kissinger willy-nilly viewed these smaller nations as pawns on a chessboard that he could manipulate, and that the result was one humanitarian catastrophe after the, another. What's your response to that indictment? You know, my, my impulse when I hear that is to take, and Kissinger hardly needs this from me or needed this from me, to take a very protective attitude. Um, but it's not so much that I want to protect Kissinger against his critics, though I'm generally inclined to do that, especially when I hear some of the criticism 
But um, to take the view that Kissinger took, and which I think his critics don't really understand, which is to say, in foreign policy, you're very rarely presented with a choice of good and bad or good and evil. Um, as his mentor, Hans Morgenthau, the founder of Realpolitik, um, in America at least, uh, used to say, um, it's always a choice in foreign policy between two evils. And if you add to that the fact that you're dealing in a situation where you don't have all the facts, you don't have everything you need to know, and yet you're compelled to act, it, it presents a very difficult situation for anyone who's looking for uh, simple and straightforward answers. Um, in terms of how one goes about acting, and here we come to one of the core principles of realpolitik, you can't simply act out of morality or really moralism, which is to say, here is the good that I want to see in the world, and I will pursue that. I want to see democracy spread all around the world. And I want to pursue that. Um, for Kissinger, that lands you in um, horrible disruptions. Um, uh, we might say we might see Vietnam as an example of that. We went into South Vietnam with the hope of spreading democracy, and that was just about the last thing that either the government of Vietnam or the villagers that we were supposed to be protecting cared about. And and um, I think Kissinger, with his emphasis not on democracy promotion, not on abstract morality, but on the reality of the national interest, really offended all of those who prefer to take an international perspective on um uh, foreign policy. Foreign policy, as made by any statesman, has to begin with national interests. At least that's what Kissinger believed. But Barry, you begin uh, your book with the Chile episode. I wonder, well, how just how realistic was Kissinger? You, of course, set as the backdrop Nazi Germany in, in Kissinger's Weltanschauung and make the case that he did not act inappropriately in Chile. Can you expand on that? Um, well, the first thing to say is that it wasn't the United States that overthrew the government of Salvador Allende. The United States was opposed to the government of Salvador Allende, but after Allende's election victory, it um, really withdrew from very active participation in uh, Chile, um, though it, it did continue to pursue um, economic sanctions and um, economic punishments that may or may not have hurt uh, Chile and the Chilean government. That's that's a point under dispute. In my book, I, I cite people to say that um, uh, Chile, despite U.S. embargoes was well compensated by the Soviet Union and Cuba, et cetera. I, I don't know how true that is, but it's not so simple as to say that because the U.S. withheld aid from Chile that uh, Allende was bound to fall. Allende fell because he lost the support first of the Chilean middle class, which uh, conducted a number of strikes, small businessmen, professionals, small uh, uh, farmers who were being squeezed by the inflation and various controls. He lost their support. And then after that, he lost the support of uh, the army. And that's what led to his downfall. Um, now, in terms of, of Kissinger's point of view, um, and this is a good example of the difficulties of foreign policy. You can look at Allende and from one point of view, see him as a committed democratic socialist uh, who was only looking out for the welfare of his people and particular, and in particular, the long suffering poor of Chile. 
But there's a whole other side of Allende. Allende was uh, Castro's best friend in Latin America. And Castro made no bones about his object to uh, pursue revolutions um, around the continent. Now, uh, which Allende should we take as the true one? And um, we can have that debate. Um, I'm inclined to think that Nixon and Kissinger got that right, that if Allende had been allowed to pursue his policies, he would have uh, turned uh, Chile into something like, if not a satellite of, of um, Russia, at least a, a, um, an, an ally of Russia. And from the Kissinger and Nixon point of view, this was something that just could not be allowed. And so when the army moved in, they were delighted. Um, now we can debate that, um, but in the fog of foreign policy, it's certainly a reasonable position to think that from the point of view of the United States, um, Allende was a disaster. Um, the problem, as I say in my book, and this is a really classic uh, problem, is that if a leader is democratically elected, does the United States or any other power have the right to um, attempt to overthrow him? I, I reemphasize, we were not the ones who overthrew Allende. Um, it was um, the Chilean people and the army. But but let's pursue the, the idea of whether we have the right to overthrow Allende. And there's no real answer to that. An example, that I, a more recent example that I cite in my book is what happened in Egypt, where the Muslim Brotherhood won a free and fair election and the army overthrew that government. Um, should we have celebrated that or condemned it? Well, I think most people um, in the U.S. Uh, foreign policy establishment celebrated it. Barry, let's look at another area of Cold War conflict, namely the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. If Kissinger was criticized on Chile, he was lambasted from the right for not pursuing a more aggressive rollback strategy. In fact, in 1976, when Ronald Reagan ran against Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination, he assailed both Ford and Nixon for pursuing a policy of appeasement toward the Kremlin. Their argument, the argument on the right was that detente was a disaster, that the United States needed to strike out a more aggressive posture. Those sentiments are voiced today in a column by George F. Will in the Washington Post, where he says, Kissinger nimbly managed a Cold War that needed winning, not managing. And Will says that Kissinger, unlike Reagan, did not realize that we could triumph against the Soviet Union. What's your response to that criticism? Well, I, I I think it's obviously more complicated than that. I'm not sure what uh, triumph over the Soviet Union uh, would have meant in uh, 1969 when um, uh, Nixon took office and and Kissinger became his chief foreign policy advisor. Were we to um, go to war with the Soviet Union in order to triumph over the Soviet Union? Um, the Soviet Union by 1980, when Reagan came in, was a much weaker, uh, much more vulnerable society. And I would point out that um, when the Soviet Union fell, Kissinger was one of the lonely voices saying this is not going to bring in some sort of foreign policy utopia. What it's going to bring in is a somewhat weakened but nonetheless very real rival on the European continent. That is to say, the Soviet Union might have gone away, but Russia was not going to go away. And the only thing I'd add to that, and I don't know how George Will came out on this, uh, one of the great achievements of Nixon Kissinger as it's presented today, and I haven't seen any criticism of it, was the opening to China. Now, to achieve the opening to China, Nixon and Kissinger had to make peace with a man who had killed, I think it's estimated, 50 million people, uh, Mao Zedong. 
And there were conservatives from William F. Buckley to Pat Buchanan who were utterly opposed to reaching out to China. Um, now Kissinger and, and um, Nixon reached out on pure realpolitik principles. It was better to play off Russia and China than to face Russia with one hand tied behind your back by refusing to engage with China. Now, you can de debate all of that, but to my mind, that debate ha has long faded. I, I Maybe George Will thinks the opening to China was a bad idea, but if, if his feeling is that we could have um, somehow achieved victory over the Soviet Union and also victory over communist China. I think he's just whistling in the dark. One thing that occurs to me when, when you're talking about China and the murderous reign of Mao Zedong is that Nixon and Kissinger, as far as I know, have not been attacked on humanitarian grounds for that policy from the left. Am I correct there? As far as I know, you're correct. Um, certainly at the time, um, the attacks came from the right. And, you know, in terms of, of morality, how can one argue that um, the man who killed 50 million people is now shaking hands with the president of the United States? And um, I think you're right that the left hasn't even discussed this issue. But I have to say, um, over the years, um, even though I began as a leftist and still view myself as a liberal, I've become very disenchanted with the left on foreign policy grounds. I think, by and large, it engages in these um, moralistic outbursts which have nothing to do with power and nothing to do with the realities on the ground. Uh, but I, I, Jacob, I think you're correct. I think that um, the left is very uh, choosy in, in where it will condemn Kissinger, even though there are other cases that would seem to be even more appropriate to their criticisms. This reminds me, too, that I think Samantha Power in her book, The Problem from Hell, actually never discusses uh, China and and the Cultural Revolution and the purges that took place there. She tends to skate over that episode. Well, what um, I say, let me interrupt you and say, um, I, I think Samantha Power wouldn't include, despite the huge number of deaths, would not define that as genocide. Maybe I'm wrong there, but her book was about genocide. And I think the massacres uh, that it took place in China, um, uh, she would not view as genocide. But in any case, what I'd add to that is that uh, Samantha Power, for all her um, moralistic takes at the time, became good friends with Kissinger. They went to baseball games together. Kissinger had high praise for her work at the UN. So um, it's complicated. He was, he was the ultimate realist, Barry. <laughs> um, I, there's another thing that I... And that, she was know, an I, attractive woman. <laughs> I've been uh, sifting through your book again and um, wanted to touch a little bit on Kissinger himself, his personality. You point out on page 99 that in the third volume of his memoirs, Years of Renewal, Kissinger praises Gerald Ford for his strength of character, which he attributed to his all-American background and upbringing, and said that, Kissinger wrote that, nowhere else is there to be found the same generosity of spirit and absence of malice as in small-town America. And you then say this is an odd, even remarkable statement coming from an East Coast intellectual and former Harvard professor. Can you uh, talk a little about why you thought that was such a remarkable statement? Well, think about the people you know in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and how many of them are going to rush out and praise um, middle Americans, whom I'm sure all of your friends in Cambridge see as gun-toting Trump, you know, racist Trump supporters. So, um, uh, yes, it's unusual for, uh, you know, an unquestioned intellectual and international sophisticate like um, Henry Kissinger to praise middle America. A great deal of, of that and, it, and it, it became a kind of foundation for um, 
if not his thinking, at least how he conducted himself on the on these matters. Um, that 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 uh, Kissinger, when he was in the army, met with farm boys from Indiana and Oklahoma, and found that he liked them a lot. He liked their genuineness, their honesty. I I suspect half of the ones he met disliked him for being a Jew, but I don't know. He never got into that. But he came away from the army with a very positive view of middle America. And and another um, very sophisticated intellectual, I quote, and please forgive my mispronunciation, Czesław Miłosz, the a Nobel Prize winning Polish poet, when he was living in America, said he loved small town fairs and, and parades, that, that he really felt a kind of authenticity there that he didn't feel um, among the, the elites on the East and West Coasts. So, you know, Kissinger wasn't the only one, but I do, I do think that helped make him stand out. He, he always, I shouldn't say always, but certainly in his... Uh, maturing years was very much a part of the Cambridge intelligentsia. His friends included Arthur Schlesinger and 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 um, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. I think a number of those relationships frayed as the Vietnam War continued and criticisms of uh, the Nixon White House mounted. But Kissinger was an unusual character in that he could um, more than hold his own in the most sophisticated circles while admiring the naive authenticity of middle America. You alluded just now to Kissinger's Jewish heritage. It's not something that he tended to dwell upon. How significant do you think it was in his rise? What occurred to me is that Kissinger really is perhaps the most successful Jewish intellectual of the post-1945 era. In the 1930s, as you know, Harvard had quotas on Jewish students. He went to Harvard. He, he joined the Council on Foreign Relations, where, as we know, the American establishment was not overly hospitable towards, towards Jews. And then he became an aide to Nelson Rockefeller. He joined the Republican Party, which had its own era of anti-Semitism and hostility to Israel. It's it's quite remarkable, isn't it, that he penetrated all these institutions? It, it is remarkable. I, I don't want to um, begin to um, psychologize or psychoanalyze Kissinger. He was an, a remarkably driven person. And um, even though I'm reluctant to get into analysis, it's hard not to think that that drive came in part from his Jewish background, his background with Nazi Germany, um, the um, uprootedness of having to leave uh, a homeland that he was comfortable in until the Nazis arrived and, and restart his life in America. So, um, um, I, I think, you know, we have to attribute at least some of the drive, some of the ambition, some of the cold bloodedness to um, Kissinger's Jewish background. But, you know, he was an exceptional person. I was watching a rerun the other evening of Ken Burns' documentary on baseball, and he was talking about Jackie Robinson and the first black to make it in the major leagues. And what an enormous effort it took on his part to ignore all of the racist slurs and and the awful practices Um that he had to endure. But he was, Jackie Robinson was an extraordinarily exceptional human being in his own way. And these are very different areas. And so I'm not comparing the individuals, but just to say in his own way, Kissinger was a very remarkable individual also. Don't forget that he just published a book at age 99 and and was working, as I understand it, on two others. So, you know, there's just an almost inhuman drive, an inhuman will that owes something to Jewishness, uh, but also something to his exceptional personality.
You know, Barry, if you if you think about it, and you talk about Hannah Arendt and Hans Morgenthau and Leo Strauss in your book, and the and Kissinger's intellectual relations to them, they all too had a somewhat similar drive, didn't they, in in the United States to to succeed? So, in that sense, I suppose Kissinger is not entirely unique, though he may he may have taken it the furthest. Well, I think that's true. Um, I, I'm not sure I would compare those three. I mean, there, there are reasons to think of Kissinger in that context. It's a German-Jewish context. These are people who grew up with a continental and a spe- spe- specifically German philosophical tradition, which is very foreign to the American uh, tradition. And in a moment, I'll give you an example of, of how that's so. But um, so I think they all um, came to America under special circumstances, but with that drive. But again, I I would just stress Kissinger's specialness, just as I would Jackie Robinson. There are very few people who could have done what Jackie Rob, very few black people who could have done what Jackie Robinson did. There were very few Jewish people who could have done what Henry Kissinger did. Now, I talked about the kind of continental perspective that I think shapes all of these people and distinguishes them from a traditional American perspective. And apart from the suspicion that all of them had about the workings of democracy, democracy for them was not a religion. Democracy for them had brought Adolf Hitler into power. So they were always going to have doubts about democracy, that Americans have a hard time understanding. But as part of that German and continental um, intellectual tradition, they were not liberal. And by that, I mean liberal thinking uh, started with the individual. Government was um, built up out of individuals and out of agreements among individuals. For these German Jewish thinkers with a continental tradition, liberalism was a myth that government existed, that it was never going to disappear, and that you always had to deal with government. Um, I remember someone complaining to me that Kissinger had gone to advise Trump. What do you think of that, Barry? And I said, would you rather he didn't do that? Government isn't going to disappear just because people we dislike are in power. If anything, that's more of a reason to become involved. You can always be oppositional, um, but it's it's very difficult. And this was a problem Kissinger had with the anti-Semitic Nixon. It's very difficult to deal with power that exists and is not going to go away, but which you yourself cannot wholly subscribe to. Barry, as a as a final question, you talk in your book, you say about Kissinger, the lessons he has been trying to teach may not be to the liking of most people, but they are more important than ever before. Is that the case? Are we returning to an era of great power conflict? Or are Kissinger's critics right who say that well, he didn't really know anything about climate change? Uh, he didn't he didn't understand economics and all this talk about balance of power and so forth is antediluvian. Jacob, your guess is as good as mine. We're trying to uh, predict the future here and and you deal with it every day. I mean, in that sense, I'm I'm just a um, kibitzer. But what I would say is that we need Kissinger as a corrective, if nothing else. If we're going to disagree with him, that's fine. But we need him as a corrective to our natural instincts, which are always to promote human rights, always to promote democracy, always to condemn those with whom we disagree. Um, I would just say as a final advertisement for Kissinger, if you want to understand Kissinger's uh, timeliness and relevance to our time, I think his book on China 
is incredibly valuable to read in order to understand the way the Chinese view the world and not just to demonize them and not just to say, oh, this is an awful dictatorship which is suppressing the Tibetans and the Uyghurs and endless other peoples. It's doing all of that. But what is the Chinese perspective and what can we do either to change that perspective directly or to work with China on problems that we share and and try to mitigate the problems that inevitably exist between us. So um, Kissinger, I I would say, is more relevant than ever. Barry, on that note, I would like to thank you for your provocative, thoughtful, and cogent remarks. And it was a pleasure to discuss Kissinger and his legacy with you. Uh, Jacob, I'd like to think that I'm cogent, but not all that provocative. So, Au contraire. Thank you, Barry. <laughs>